Welcome to the inside. As 2023 moves into the home stretch, Hollywood is setting its sights on a happier holiday season. With strikes resulting in better compensation for workers and studios racing to full production, there is real excitement about getting back to doing what Hollywood does best, entertaining audiences. And perhaps the holiday's most anticipated new film is being unwrapped on Christmas Day. Produced by Oprah Winfrey, Steven Spielberg, and Quincy Jones, The Color Purple is a film based on the Broadway musical by the same name, which in turn is based on the 1982 novel by Alice Walker. It is the second film adaptation, the first being Spielberg's 1985 film. After watching early clips of this musical version directed by Blitz Bazawula, Alice Walker said, quote, This is what I always hoped it would be. And today we're especially thrilled to welcome one of the creative leaders and the composer of The Color Purple, Chris Bowers. He grew up in and around Los Angeles, where he was playing at a piano keyboard by the time he was four. Chris attended L.A. County High School for the Arts before getting a master's degree from Juilliard in jazz performance and film composition. He's a Grammy nominee for his work in music, an Emmy winner for his work in TV, and an Academy Award nominee for his work in film. His musical signature can be heard in films including The Green Book, King Richard, The Haunted Mansion, and the hit TV series Bridgerton. Welcome, Chris Bowers. Thanks for having me, James. Appreciate it. Wow. Classic underachiever. (laughs) I'm thrilled. I have spent most of my life in and around Los Angeles, and it's wonderful that you are someone that grew up in and around Los Angeles as well. Yeah, definitely. Born and bred. Well, I've seen this movie. I was, Blitz invited a group of us to go see it. And there are so many things I want to get into. But first of all, thank you for being here. What's it like when someone calls you and says, uh, Oprah and Steven Spielberg and Quincy Jones and Blitz are doing this film and we'd like you to be a part of it? What was that like? Yeah, pretty surreal. It felt like such a huge honor to be thought of for this project. You know, when I first heard they were remaking The Color Purple, my first instinct and question was was why? Like, why would they do that again? And once they said that Blitz was involved, that was actually what made me feel like I needed to be a part of it. I think that anybody taking on this incredibly important story, uh, anyone stepping into the next iteration of that had some pretty massive shoes to fill. And especially thinking about how that would impact the role for for music. And so it really was Blitz and my being a fan of his and seeing his films before and knowing that he would do something incredibly special that made me trust that uh, it was something that uh, would be worth being involved in. The New York Times uh, review calls The Color Purple a monumental work, which I think is pretty spectacular. Now that you've had a chance to see the finished film, how would you describe it to our listeners? I mean, exactly that. It's an epic version of this story. It's something that you've never seen before in terms of how it combines the beautiful imagery with the incredible music and the choreography. Yeah, I remember seeing the first set of dailies that Blitz shared with me. And even before that, he shared with me still images of some of the locations that he scouted personally himself. And just seeing the landscape that this story traverses already made me feel like it was going to be something that uh, we hadn't seen before. You've created music for dramas and, uh, well, all all manner of film, but here you're really recreating something that was on Broadway and was going to be integrated into a a film in a new way. What was that process like? You saw the Broadway musical. Did you see it and have visions in your head that this could be a, a movie when you got the movie assignment? Did you think over the Broadway musical? How did you think of bringing music into a motion picture? I remember seeing the musical on Broadway. Uh, it was the version that Cynthia Revo was playing Seely for. And I remember weeping, watching her sing. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was her singing I'm Here, but just that whole musical and, and the production of it and the way the music was written for it just had a really visceral impact on me uh, in the stage version of it. And so with the film version, the thing that I really appreciated is that Blitz brought me on far earlier than I'm I'm usually ever brought on for a film because he wanted me to be embedded in that process uh, and a huge part of that process in reimagining those those songs. And so 
you know, I think being involved that early allowed me to know those melodies backwards and forward. It, it allowed me to see all of the intention that Blitz and the entire team were bringing to reinterpreting those songs and the references that Blitz had from hip hop to soul to blues and gospel. Like there's so many references that Blitz had that I think breathed a new life into all of this music. So by the time I was writing any of the score, I just really had all that material deeply set within me. The LA Times praised several moments in this film that depart into kind of fantasy dream sequences. And one of them takes place on an art deco stage, complete with an orchestra that plays the song, What About Love? How did you and Blitz work uh, to create that moment? Yeah, that's one of the things that also excited me about how Blitz was going to approach most of the songs in this. Uh, and a lot of the moments in this in general was heightening Seeley's imagination. You know, he often talks about his hesitation taking on this role as directing this movie. And one of the things that made him feel like he could was the first line in Alice Walker's book where she is writing a letter to God. And he always says anyone who can write a letter to God must have an incredible imagination. And so he had these sprawling, ambitious set pieces that would be these imagination or like us being taken into Seeley's imagination. One of those, like you said, is what about love? And so for that one, one of the things that we referenced was actually a Marvin Gaye recording, a Marvin Gaye singing with an orchestra. And I can't remember what the piece was, but there was something about that arrangement that Blitz really loved, that it had this modernity to it while also feeling like something that was classic and and of the 40s, 30s era, uh, essentially, in terms of like the way the orchestra makes you feel. So really, it was about trying to find ways to do our version of that and taking the song into that space and having this huge orchestra accompany it. You're working on the the compositions before the cameras roll, when the cameras are rolling. Talk about the working process with Blitz. Blitz brought me on super early. So I was working well before they started filming and then when they started filming, I then moved on to the score. And so I was here in L.A. and while Blitz was on set and we had almost weekly Zoom meetings where I was sending him little clips. And I think he even played some of it on set. Um, and then that went all the way through until the final mix working on the score side. So you created recordings, sent them to him, and then he used them on set in order to set a mood or set a tone and and uh, help the actors. Yeah, and, and for him to already start to get his his head wrapped around what the score would be and what the sound would be for the film, and they already were editing while they were filming as well. And so I was getting, you know, not only dailies, but even little short sequences that John Paul, the editor, had cut together. And this is one of the first films I worked on where there was no temp score either. Like, once we got into the edit, I already had a couple of cues where we could establish that as the sound, but Blitz... And John both trusted me to continue to build on the sound of the score. So we didn't, we really fought the usual tendency to have temp score to kind of set a tone and a mood and really allowed our idea of what the score should sound like take precedent. You talk about Blitz a lot and his influence and creative brilliance, but you've worked with Shonda Rhimes and Jay-Z and Lee Daniels and even Kobe Bryant. Having worked with these visionary creatives and many more, but is there some quality they all have in common that you admire or you have discovered? What is it that they all do? Yeah, I'd say there's a few things, but one of the biggest things is attention to detail. I'll never forget moments sitting with Kobe and having him listen to pieces of music I wrote for his documentary and him sitting in complete silence with his eyes closed completely focused on the music that this at the time like 25 year old kid was writing essentially and and taking it incredibly seriously and same with blitz so every cue that i wrote even if it was two minutes in a 20 minute long reel blitz wanted to watch the entire reel to see how it played in the context of that or same with each of those individuals you, you mentioned and so um i think the incredible attention to detail and the obsession with learning and growing and curiosity. Each of those individuals never rested on their laurels of what they've already achieved. And they all were obsessed with learning their craft on an, an incredibly detailed level. And so 
yeah, I think those two things have been so inspiring to see consistently across the board. Chris, you've been a contributor to the Sundance Film Composers Lab at Skywalker Ranch. We're well aware we do events up there at that magical place. What does film do for your music that perhaps other mediums don't do? I think it contextualizes it emotionally. I love instrumental music. I love music with lyrics as well, but as a creator, I've never really been interested or that interested in in becoming a singer or anything like that. And so I really have a deep love for music that has a clear sense of emotion and story that's purely instrumental, but I feel like visuals give it that clarity in terms of the context and the story and the depth and the marrying of those two things is always like a one plus one equals three. Is there a process? I mean, ultimately, you're trying to connect to that person in the dark in the movie theater, Mm -hmm. right? Musically and emotionally, emotionally, right? Isn't that it? Yeah. You're trying to connect emotionally with them. Yeah. Is there a process that you go through in your mind to to feel like you know when you think, oh my gosh, I think we're going to land here with, with something great with people in the audience in the dark watching this? Yeah, you know, I'm a very emotional person, but it's it takes a bit to get there for me. Like I I will unashamedly cry watching a movie, but it also has to be a movie that strikes this chord in in a really resonant way for me. And so I think that I've learned to trust my own visceral reaction to things. So whenever I'm writing music to something, I'm really trying to make myself feel an involuntary emotion because I feel like any time that I'm playing something and creating something and so much of what I'm creating is coming from whatever you want to call it, the universe, muses, God, like it's coming from something else and it's just flowing through me. And any time that I do something that makes me feel chills or makes me feel an emotion very clearly, to me, that's something else at work. And so in that moment, I'm always like, okay, that means that something is worth pursuing. And I find that when I have that clarity of an emotional reaction myself, that's usually the piece of music that the director really loves or that ends up connecting with that person in the theater. You consider yourself a keyboard. At the end of the day, that's your heart? Is you at a keyboard? Yeah, definitely. It's funny. My my wife often says that she can hear my emotions clearer when I'm playing piano than than if we're in like a, a heated conversation together. <laughs> wow. Uh, th- there is a piano right at your side right now. I can see in the background. Would yeah. you do us a huge favor? Yeah. Would you do f- 15 seconds of what your mood is right now? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Let's see here. All right. Wonderful. Uh, how would you describe that feeling? Soulful. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's a good word for it. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Our guest insider today is pianist and composer Chris Bowers. We'll be right back. The Insider Show is made possible through the generous support of Cineon, providing future ready technical solutions to cinemas. With more than 100,000 projectors installed, Cineonic now illuminates more than half of the world's cinemas every day. Visit Cineonic.com. Our guest today is Chris Bowers. He is the composer of the new musical film, The Color Purple, coming to theaters Christmas Day. Chris, in a review of one of your early shows as a band leader, the New York Times said this about your playing. Serious, thoughtful, organized, restrained. He made the piano sound better and said something strong, sweet, and normative about phrasing and rhythm in jazz right now. Where are we in the era of of jazz right now? And do you consider it your original or your core art form? Yeah, 100 percent, because I think that jazz is so much bigger than the music. And it's also so varied even in the context of the music, you know, but I think we're in a period where we're really seeing that. You know, I remember talking to people when I was younger about wanting to be a film composer and them essentially saying that like there aren't that many jazz musicians that do that. And I always cited John Williams as 
one of the greatest film composers of all time that started off as a jazz pianist. But I also think that we're in a time where we're seeing people like Kendrick Lamar be inspired by jazz musicians like Kamasi Washington and Terrace Martin. And we're seeing people like John Batiste go on to win multiple, multiple Grammys as a jazz musician. Or I have a friend named Jahan Sweet who's producing for Kendrick and Drake and Beyonce who went to Juilliard for jazz piano. And and me as a composer in film, I feel like jazz sets such a huge foundation for being able to do really almost anything in music. You grew up in and around L.A., but you you went to Juilliard, and New York is very much seen as a center of the jazz scene. Tell me about the the yin and the yang of New York and Los Angeles for music. You know, there's a vibrancy in New York that is so immediately palpable that it doesn't really exist anywhere else. You know, I think LA's music scene is growing and and it's also very vibrant, but it's kind of segmented and, and it's hard to get to. It's like you have to know where the people are or have connections to really find it. In New York, you can just walk down the street in the village and find four or five of the best jazz clubs, hearing the best jazz musicians. And it also lasts all night. Like I remember my freshman year going down, hanging out with John Batiste and some other people that I went to school with until like three or four in the morning going from jazz club to jazz club to jazz club. And it's it's so inspiring. You live at that juncture between expression and craft, right? Mm. You're, you're, you're trying to express something, but you're doing it through the discipline and the mechanics of, of the craft. Talk about that, that intersection where you live and, and to people who don't maybe understand it, just talk about that, that place. Yeah, I think it goes back to jazz for me. Like what I was saying, jazz is bigger than than the music. You know, the whole process of jazz is practicing hours and hours and hours and hours in a practice room to know your instrument, to know songs backwards and forward, only to go to the bandstand, to go to the stage and just be present in the moment and forget what you practice and just see what comes up. And it's also all about being so technically proficient on your instrument that it's not impeding the ideas that are coming out, you know? And so I think it's the same thing for me when it comes to scoring, like I might envision an idea in my mind for a sound, but it's only my technical ability with the craft that will allow that idea to come out. Feels like it's the ultimate expression of standing on a high wire above an audience without a net. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's that, um, it's that state of flow that's talked about where, It's right at that middle ground of challenging enough to keep you engaged and present and not too challenging that you're feeling lost and and discouraged. When you're on an airplane or in the car, what are you listening to? Oh, man, it's a pretty wild range. Sometimes it's lately it's been things like Stravinsky and Shostakovich or Mahler. I also uh, for this film Origin that I worked on with Ava, it was a lot of Simon Lax, who's a Polish composer that was actually the musical director for the orchestra in Auschwitz and wrote a lot of music during the Holocaust, or Steve Reich, uh, also like Kendrick Lamar and Drake and Beyonce. It's it's kind of all over the place. (laughs) You cite your father's emphasis on discipline and planning as a key integral part of your career. How did their expectations shape your professional outlook and approach? Yeah, pretty profound ways. I mean, my parents expected me to achieve on a pretty high level from the time I was I was a, a kid. And they also expected me to have high aspirations for myself and to really clarify those things for myself really early. And having that ability to visualize a goal as a young child, I think, is something that still helps me in today's time where I might be looking at what I want to achieve in 10, 15 years from now and trying to break that down into digestible bite-sized steps that I can take in order to get there, but really just that focus and dedication on the work that it takes to get there. My parents never had me dream about this lofty idea of what I wanted to be without also recognizing the intense and dedicated work it would take to get there. And so I think that that balance of dreaming these lofty, ambitious, wild dreams while also recognizing that it takes working harder than you ever thought possible to work. Are there points in in the creative process in a film or a show that you've done when you get concerned or worried about something that's not working or, or it's not where you think you want it to be? And and if you are, who are you talking through that process with or how are you getting your head around solving a challenge? 
first and foremost, the director, uh, oftentimes the editor or producers, those are the individuals who are so helpful when we're watching something and have time to sit with it and see whether or not it works. And sometimes I'll share a piece of music that we feel works really well. And then two weeks later, we're watching it and we're like, oh, that's not actually working. Or we go to see it in a theater with a test audience and it's like, oh, that's not working. So I feel like that's the first group of people, but also, honestly, my wife. My wife is a very helpful litmus test. There are times where I'm writing something and I do this all the time. I'll go upstairs and I play it on piano and she has no idea what I'm working on or what it's for. And I'll ask her, you know, what does this make you feel? And her response, it's really fascinating how many times her response is exactly what I want uh, the person to feel when I'm writing a piece of music. But there are definitely times where she tells me, oh, it feels this way. And I'm like, oh, that's not that's not what I'm trying to <laughs> evoke. And so, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned uh, that the team will show this to a test audience. When that's happening, where do you stand? You stand at the back of the theater. Where do you stand when you know people are about to watch something for the first time and you want to gauge their reactions? Yeah, in the test, I'm definitely toward the back. There are times where I'm in the middle just to get a really good seat, especially orally to hear the sound. But Usually I sit toward the back just to really be able to observe everyone, watch when people are kind of tuning out, watch when people are really enraptured by what they're watching um, and being able to get a really good sense of how the emotional journey is for everyone. What was the moment when you're in a screening room and you saw the clip of the actors with your music? What's that moment like? It never gets old, no matter what the project is. But with this one in particular, there's something about the way this movie looks and just seeing the way that Blitz and Dan Lawson, the, the cinematographer, lit these incredible environments and had these like beautiful, beautiful black people depicted on screen that for me, it felt like one of those projects that you feel so thankful to be a part of. Like, you know, I'm definitely so honored to be a part of everything I've worked on, but this one definitely stands apart as a moment where seeing the first couple of cues up against the image just made me feel like I was pinching myself and thinking about my younger self in terms of what I dreamed about doing. There is something magical, I think, about um, the fact that when you make a motion picture, it will be something that's viewed 100 years from now, mm. right? Yeah, hopefully. And if it's a good motion picture, <laughs> it'll be treasured 100 years from now. Mm. Does that occur to you when you're looking at a great musical or a great motion picture and realizing, I, I think I'm making something that's going to stand the test of time and be viewed by young film lovers many years after maybe I'm gone? Yeah, I think that I was so thankful. You know, for me, I feel like as the composer, I'm being chosen, I'm being trusted by the director or producers or these these individuals that are much more responsible in terms of pulling the team together and deciding how this all works. And so I think this film, watching it, I had that thought about the fact that with or without me, this film would be something that would be standing the test of time and be treasured for years to come. And so to be a part of that and invited to be on the team and to contribute something that felt like it helped it get to that place as well, I feel like it, it just really is an honor. Do you feel... Uh, it certainly feels to me. But do you feel that you're doing the best work of your career? I, no, I always feel like there's this, I, I, I have so much more to go. Or do you mean since since before now? Well, do you, okay, well, well, that's a good question. Do you think you're doing better work than you were five years ago? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I feel like- Really? Yeah, I feel like, um, at least as a composer, you know, as a pianist, I might say something different because I haven't been practicing so much lately. But I feel like as a composer, Every project, I can hear growth in my writing in some sort of way. And, and I take every project I take because I can see how it's going to challenge me and help me grow in a specific way. So I really feel like there's so much that I'm doing now that I feel is far beyond what I, what I was doing five years ago. When a person, a young person comes up to you and you've really inspired them, how do you talk to them? And what do you hope that you can leave someone who is a younger version of Chris Bowers coming up to you in a reception or at a premiere and you can see in their eyes that they, they think you're magic. Uh, well, we're talking to any aspiring artist, uh, musician, composer. I first just ask questions. I think that so many times when I was younger, people gave me advice that I didn't ask for. And I feel like they gave me advice without 
trying to get to know what I needed and who I was. And so I always love asking questions so I can, if I offer anything, offer something that's super specific. And then I also always talk about them navigating their mental health, because I think that's one of the toughest parts of being an artist, like even uh, harder than the music is how do you navigate when someone tells you that something you spent days on is not working? Like, how do you manage when you're not getting jobs and something inside of you is telling you that maybe you're not good enough? How do you manage a lot of the difficult moments of life outside of music and then navigate those things while trying to make an effort in your career? So I feel like those things are usually the things in my mind that make it challenging to find a career in this space. And so talking to them about their mental health and getting to know themselves on that level is important. I saw your movie with a, about a dozen people in a screening room a, a few weeks ago, and it was clear within the first 10 minutes that this was something special. And by the end, everybody sat and watched the credits roll and walked out quietly mm. <laughs> of just saying, wow, oh. uh, it's a great movie. Uh, your body of work is so admirable and exciting. And we are so lucky to have you in the industry. And we can't thank you enough for coming on with us and being involved in this this film project. And I wish you all the success uh, going forward. You're fantastic. And I wish you the best. Uh, thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Our quote of the day comes from director J.J. Abrams. He said, what's a bigger mystery box than a movie theater? You go to the theater excited to see anything. And the moment the lights go down, that's the best part. Thank you, Chris Bowers, and thank you all for listening. The Insiders is presented by Cineonic and produced by the Advanced Imaging Society in Hollywood. Our executive producers are Adam Castles in New York and Mike Piltzecker in Los Angeles. Brett Harrison produced today's show, and our technical director is Matthew Bach Lombardo. This is AIS.